people, welcome to Conversations. I'm Devin Boyd, and I have two of uh, my new guests today. I have Robin and Kimberly. And how are y'all doing today? Fine. You know, it's been a lovely day on this lovely Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. Valentine's, Valentine's Day, Day. right? Day. Yeah. You know, I keep forgetting that. Earlier today at work, I yeah. had a red shirt on. Uh-oh. It wasn't my intent. And then when I got to work, you know, those balloons and all sorts of stuff all around, I was like... Oh my. I wore black to work today because people thought I was like sad. My daughter went all out. She got our co- my co-workers, her classmates, and my husband's co-workers all Valentine's gifts. Oh, nice. She's 10 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, nice. <laughs> 10 weeks. They was like, oh, she got really good hair. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I trained her well. I, I trained already her well. see you. <laughs> Well, cool, yeah, I brought y'all on this show because um, I heard a, a little bit about what y'all do. Um, of course, I'd like y'all to explain a little bit more uh, for the people um, that are, might be watching as well as listening. Um, so, for one, uh, my wife did a photo shoot with you, right? Mm-hmm. And um, that's kind of how she connected uh, you and I together. Um, so, yeah. how did y'all meet and uh, what do you guys do? Well, um, so... Uh, we are both social workers, mm-hmm. and we met when we were both interns at the uh, the National Association of Social Workers. Their Texas chapter is actually in Austin, and we met there. And my first day, I was a little bit nervous. Um, I don't know, like uh, the social work profession in general is uh, historically made up of, I'm just going to say it, white women. Mm-hmm. Old white women. Old white women. <laughs> and so <laughs> when I saw Kim... Um, at the table, like introducing her for my first day, I was like, I was so excited. Oh, she yeah. said I look nervous, but I was so <laughs> excited that I saw another black woman. I was yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> and so I couldn't wait till everybody left. I just had a conversation yeah. with her, and then from there, just kind of grew and blossomed into what we're doing right now. We're doing a lot, so, um, but that's how we met. Um, we were interns, and I'll tell you about what we did. We were at the, the, um, the chapter office you can tell us yeah so um at when we were entering at the texas chapter in esw mm-hmm. um we saw a need um we both came from different graduate programs she went to utsa mm-hmm. san antonio and i went to ut um, austin and we were learning like in social work we learn what it means to you know equity and how to um, stand up for vulnerable populations mm-hmm. like we've been kind of told this since the get but for some reason we both felt in our graduate programs there was something extremely lacking and the fact that social workers are present in every system you can think of and we still see so many problems Mm -hmm. for the people that we're trying to help like our job was to put ourselves out of business so why do we still have work Um, so we kind of came together and it was hard but we did it we established the the Race, Equity, Accountability, and Leadership Committee. Mm. We call it real. Um, and and we're focused like on yeah. fighting, um, talk, being real about racism. Yeah. Um, and actually training up social workers how they should have been trained up while they're in school. Mm. Uh-huh. So like social workers, they so there's diversity and inclusion, mm-hmm. uh, which is completely different mm-hmm. from having an anti-racist lens. What um, the University of Texas in San Antonio, what they pride themselves on is cultural competency, where you learn about the intersectionalities of yourself, mm-hmm. like whether it be um, your religion, mm-hmm. your um, your sex, your gender, your um, just, you know, your economic status, your, you know, all these things. Like you learn all the things about yourself, but you don't really learn how, um, and you learn your own biases, your mm-hmm. internal biases right. and things mm-hmm. like that, but you don't really learn how to have conversations, typical conversations whenever you see that your clients are being, um, like taken, or they're not being heard right. um, whenever you if you're the only social work in your agent agency and you just happen to be the only person of color and they're serving all these people of color mm-hmm. you know, 
you're not being heard, and then you run the risk of losing, you know, you're afraid to say anything because you right. might lose your job. Mm-hmm. And so we um, we actually have town halls, and uh, we work with a phenomenal team um, in different regions of Texas, as well as we have mentorships. We started with advisors from um, the, um, the clinical director at the YWCA, okay. which their, um, their, their mission is to eliminate racism. Um, and then we work with my uh, dean of UTSA, um, um, Dr. Uh, Martel Teasley. Um, we had Dr. Roundtree. Dr. Roundtree, which is who's the, an associate professor at UT Austin mm-hmm. and also um, associate director of the, let me try to get this right, Urban. IURPA Institute for Urban Research um, Policy and analysis yes. we it. also had <laughs> we also had like mike mayner who's like a pillar of the community uh-huh. he's been in the, he's been in the game for a long time uh-huh. and they were in joyce james who's um retired from um, health and human services oh, okay. and she's now like her own consultant doing the same work um and she like they were like we've been trying to do this forever mm-hmm. and we just want to pass on the torch to you and you know, hopefully that you know they'll listen to you because you'll be like oh just a, a new social worker right, you know? right. <laughs> yeah uh, but um we were intentional about that getting people on board and um really being there to like allow them to pour into us and and that's where we are today and so um we're really excited it's something that we're really passionate about mm-hmm. um and we all have our our areas of expertise um that we're trying to grow capacity capacity in mm-hmm. um and yeah, well, I mean, we could talk a little bit about about that, but that's how we met. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, we do we do three things together right now. So what yeah. is it? So we are on real. Mm-hmm. We're both founding chairs, okay. but right now I am um, the chair of the, the statewide committee, mm-hmm. and Robin serves on a steering committee um, and part of that leadership. Um, so we literally our model. I'm a community organizer at heart, uh-huh. so our model is literally to activate social workers in every region that we are present in Texas and to kind of help them come together. Because the problem is we work in silos, which perpetuates all the systemic racial disparities we see in everything that, like every system we're connected to. Um, So we do real. Um, We're also part- Oh yeah, <laughs> we're, pa- we're passionate we're about this. <laughs> yeah, we do real, and we're also part of the Black Mamas Community Collective. Uh-huh. So the Black Mamas Community Collective um, was founded earlier last year okay. um, through a grant that we received from the Saint David's Foundation. Right mm-hmm. now, like our wonderful lead private investigator. Um, Principal investigator is Dr. Roundtree, who and is mother also doula. mother doula. Like mm-hmm. she's she's kind of like the woman who who birthed birth us. Yes. Oh, um, cool. So it's a collective of women, social workers, non-social workers, community members, policymakers, nurses, like the whole shebang. Yeah. Um, we're trying to fight that 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 disparity. Like uh-huh. black women in Texas, we we are less than four percent of the births annually, but we're dying at eleven percent rate. In Texas and it's even worse when you look at nationally and the United States just sucks like although we're supposed to be a first world country right. um, black and brown bodies are dying right um, and the, yeah and I can speak on that like personally uh, like you know um, your wife she did my maternity photos and I had a like a rough pregnancy and so my maternity photos was a way to like you know because I'm a therapist right. and I like to do self-care and blah 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 uh-huh. and so it was like a really like self-care healing process for uh-huh. me Um, because I had a rough pregnancy and then I had some unfortunately I had some like I had eclampsia not preeclampsia I had eclampsia after like two weeks after I gave birth and Mm -hmm. um, also some issues uh, with like postpartum depression and things like that and um, I was I had a unfortunate incident happen to me where I felt like if I you know I couldn't trust my healthcare healthcare providers uh-huh. and I was admitted to the hospital for a couple for three days and uh, like I really felt like I couldn't close my eyes because I thought I was gonna die and yeah. it wasn't ne- nothing I, I don't know if you n- understand like eclampsia like if you have like high blood pressure you can run the risk of seizures mm-hmm. and they have to put you on magnesium to prevent the seizures right. and so I was on magnesium for um, a little bit over 24 hours mm-hmm. And, like, I literally, I was supposed to, like, relax 
you know, but they couldn't, like, I couldn't relax because I, I didn't trust these people because y'all right. let me down the first four hours I was here, you know what I mean? I don't, like, if I trust them, they just go, like, I'm going to die, you know? Yeah, uh-huh. And so, be real, though? Like, that's yeah. the problem. Like, I, black I don't and brown die. folks, we don't trust the health system Mm-mm. in this country. Right. Like, our history, man, our history with the system, one, like, even if, even though I haven't experienced the beautiful thing of birth yet, mm-hmm. like, I have, like, every black woman has experienced poor health care. Right. I've had bad experiences myself. You I don't want to be too graphic. For yourself. Like, why do we have to advocate? Like, advocate, why do I have, I have to, to fight? fight myself? That's why they, we look like angry black women because you ain't listening to us. You're not listening to us. And then, and then like, it, and then that's why I love the Black Mamas Community Collective because we're kind of hitting the issue from every angle you could think of. Yeah. We're fighting, doing with policy. We're actually providing doula services mm-hmm. to women, black women in Travis County and Williamson County we're trying to spread out to Central Texas and hopefully all of Texas where we're providing that village support because we have let's be real black families not all of them right. are able to have what white families have when it comes to birth right. you know they're not able my to my mama didn't even know what a doula was yeah you so know, like she was like you're gonna be in a hospital I was like maybe mm-hmm. maybe what if I want a natural and I told her I was doing natural birth she was like you better take that medicine yeah. and when I had eclampsia she was like you can go home it's okay we'll take care of you I was like mom I could die I could die right. in my sleep yes. are you serious so I'm not ready to talk about that <laughs> it's, a, it's a little tra- it's, tra- it's, a it's trauma yeah. it's tra- traumatic for me yeah. but we do all other stuff too Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we also like also serve on the branch, the NASW branch steering committee. Um, and she's like the nomination leadership identification committee. Mm-hmm. We serve on that um, as well as the business that we're we uh, just started. We just started, yeah. and um, we have uh, along with some women that are separate from our, you know the business. We mm-hmm. have like contracts with UT University of Texas and other places, and we're excited um, to where that's going to take us. And I, I, I'm fortunate to be able to work with Kim because she knows how I work, and oh, that's good. you know, yeah. we yeah. we, we we're bounce good. off each other pretty well. Yeah, oh, we're yeah, good, good work work wives. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> like I know, like I think on last Friday we were working on like four projects simultaneously, mm. trying to get awards, awards, of nominating people, getting people, and um, getting paperwork done for our yeah. business. Yes, business contacting our contracts for net mm-hmm. trainings we're doing with UT School of Social Work faculty and staff. Yeah. And then I, I scheduled a meeting with a, a government relations person with NASW. So because mm-hmm. we're on policy. Yeah, for real, we're going to be at the at the national um, at the Social at the Work Capitol. Advocacy Day. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. um, we're going to be at the Capitol. We're going to do a town hall there um, yeah. to talk about with, with social work students. And so we just, you know, we enjoy doing this work. You know, if you find something that you love, Make Just, it make it your job. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't true. even feel like work. Work, yeah. And then if and you cool. do it with someone, um, yeah, it's just like, hey, sis, like, you know, sister, my sister in love. Mm-hmm. It's always good just with a business, period, having a, a partner in the business yeah. because sometimes, like y'all already said, y'all balance each other out. So it's, sometimes it's hard just trying to run a business by yourself because then yeah. it's like, for one, you get stuck in a rut uh, probably more times than you should if you had that, like, other person just to give you some other idea mm-hmm. that might spark you know that our idea may not be the best at the time but that at least maybe spark a different idea with you and that you know helps so yeah really and you cool. can't always share your dreams with everybody because yeah. they think yeah, you're crazy true. <laughs> true, true i didn't true, share true. some things where i was like i'm for real kim i've thought about this and this is gonna come to f- pass mm-hmm. and you know even three years ago when we were talking about region leads for the real for real for committee, committee it's like we already have what Three we have leads. three regional leads. Mm. Like people, like we want to build capacity. We're trying to do like legacy work. That's what right. our mentors yeah. like to say. Legacy but like, work, yeah. We understand like everything. What we're trying to do, what the the work we're trying to do, we can't do it by ourselves. Right. And I think we're modeling that in our partnership because like sometimes you're gonna have to tap out and you right. need someone to step forward. Right. Yeah. Just, if and you I've tapped out before working yeah. with her. Yeah, and then mm-hmm. we, we, we go back and forth. We make sure that no matter if you're tired, someone take over the car and, right. and, and drive the next four hours right, and then exactly. switch it. So mm-hmm. we kind of got that good balance, and I think we're trying to model that for all the leaders that we help develop and colleagues that we bring to the fold. Yeah, and That's the cool. thing about racism, it's going to be, it's always going to be a whole it's lot of work. It's going to be there. So it's going to be a lot of work. 
so we're not worried about competing with anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, our our con- <laughs> our our mentors, our consultants themselves, and they do the work in other places. Right. It's going to be a lot of work. So uh, we're just excited to be part of the the, the charge. Yeah. Yeah, I said racism. Uh, I've heard the word before meeting with you guys, deconstructing racism. Mm -hmm. What does that even mean? So racism itself, I love to tell people that that word itself is its definition. Mm -hmm. Like, it's regarding race, but ism means a system. It's a system that is based on race. That is Mm -hmm. exactly what racism is. So when I hear the term deconstructing racism, it's deconstructing the system that's based on race. And unfortunately, like, look at our country. We were, <laughs> we were built on a system based on race. So mm-hmm. a lot of the things that we have to deconstruct is not necessarily, oh, how people feel, how right. people bias. Like I always tell people that it is not my job to change people's hearts. That's God's job. Right. We are human beings. We are not God. But our job is to change the systems that we perpetuate, right. intentionally or unintentionally, mm-hmm. to deconstruct the thing deconstruct the how race has caused a lot of people to be at the bottom no matter what no mm-hmm. matter what they do no matter how they start if you look at every system the criminal justice system healthcare system education it's system systemic. Yeah. it's systemic because all these things are working in concert to keep us at the bottom because we were based on a black at the bottom that's mm-hmm. how that was what we were founded on yeah and you know just to sum it up like race um can black people be racist? You know, that's a question I had. On oh, okay, <laughs> well, we'll answer that later. But you know, um, like the system was made by white people, uh-huh. and so um, it's based on like white supremacy. And so, if you don't have power, you aren't able to be racist. Mm-hmm. And so, um, race plus power is race plus power. Is racism. And that's not our definition. It's the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. So if you don't know about it, Google it. Yeah, do yeah. undoing racism training. We ain't trying to take credit for their work. No, so that's, <laughs> like, that's People Institute for Survival and Beyond. Book. They've been doing this Got work a for way them. over for decades. Yeah. And um, like people don't understand it. Like we, like human beings, we're always going to have bias mm-hmm. because we're human beings. Right. Um, and no one person thinks exactly the same live the exact same life. Right. So because of those differences and how we experience life and how we how we view life, people are always going to butt heads. Mm-hmm. So I tell people like, yeah, black and brown people in the United States, we could be discriminatory. We can have bias, it's just like bias. white people. But the difference is white folks, the systems back them to the point that they can actually cause harm. They can actually oppress mm-hmm. because the systems give them that power to do so. So yeah. they... And they yeah, and racist. unfortunately, you know, like, um, black and brown people, like, it's the system that was already built by, like, white supremacy, and we have a wonderful woman that we work with, Nicole uh, Meissen, who yes. can break it down to you. She's a white her. woman. She's a strong ally. Um, but uh, sometimes, black and brown people, we could participate in that system by mm-hmm. oppressing others because of the power that mm-hmm. we, you know, that we want, um, that was built, you know, but we're all trying to be, like, what was um, the person, the pe- people that have the power? We're trying to be like them, right. and so that's why sometimes it looks like it could we could be racist, but uh-huh. we're just perpetuating like mm-hmm. the oppression, the internalized oppression that has been forced upon us mm-hmm. by this culture of white supremacy. So that's um, that's. We can talk more about that. Mm-hmm. You can ask your question whenever your question, <laughs> we whenever your question to comes up. Forward. We don't want to jump Whenever forward. your question comes up, no, it, we'll go ahead. I just have a list of questions. It's not necessarily okay. in order. If it's in order. Okay. It's, not, it's no order. It's okay. No order. You want us to answer that now? Well, so. Okay. But yes. No? Yes? Yeah, yes. Yes. Um, but I was going to uh, say I like the fact that y'all did break down what racism means, mm-hmm. um, which you're probably going to explain. So by definition, then I can see why no black people can't necessarily be racist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just gave you the definition though. Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> because y'all gave, by giving that definition, because other than that, I would have combated you with it, right? Oh. Yeah, and the thing is that's, honestly, that's how there's so much confusion about what it is, right. even yeah. within the white, black, brown, and whatever uh-huh. community, because 
definitions have power. Mm -hmm. yeah. The question is, who create these definitions? Right. How have definitions changed over time? Even before the United States, going to European times. Right. How have definitions of things changed so that people can keep justifying things? Mm -hmm. But how can you ever justify death? How can you ever justify that oppression? Right. So the definitions have weight and power so when mm -hmm. we break down what racism is that's just that word it forces people to understand like hey right yeah and without breaking confidentiality no there is no good racism <laughs> and there is no bad there yes. is no good racism there is no. no such thing no such thing racism is based on kim knows why i'm saying that. yes yes yes, yes. we, yeah. we yeah. have some, a in lot of training <laughs> yes. but um yeah i tell people like racism is based on believing that a per like a group of people based on a race mm -hmm. are inherently God given more higher and more worthy and and, 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 and superior to another group. Mm -hmm. That's all that racism is. So the way that shows here in the United States, that group that has that power who 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 the systems attach as right. being more superior are because they made the those systems. who identify as white or who was grandfathered into being white because we know right. it took a while for some groups to become white in the United States. Right. Yeah, took a while. You know, you have to. You kind of had to like give up. You know, your culture to mm -hmm. be the American. You know, to have the American dream. Yeah, and so um, that's and you said you said that's all it is. Like that that's. The definition is simple. It's very simple. It's simple but it's so powerful. However, it's so powerful. powerful. Yeah. It's not all that is. Like it's it's like so much that needs to be deconstructed. Like how can like how can like we just did strategic planning, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> last week on mm -hmm. for BNCC. But like I can't even fathom like doing a strategic plan on how to like deconstruct racism. Like, oh my goodness, it's like because it, it's so multifaceted, right? Yeah. Right. Because it's so ingrained in society mm -hmm. and stuff of that sort. And I tell people, like, look. Yeah. This is, I tell people, it's going to take a lot of people. So we will never run out of work. Right. Um, no. And the work that we want to do, we want to do that healing work. Because right. it takes a lot of healing for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. Black bodies, brown bodies, white bodies for us yeah. to kind of move past that. And you and I know you said you said um, and sometimes we disagree or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but she said that only God can change your heart, you know. And so I've been um, for in honor of Black History Month, I've been posting uh, yes, my Angelou, Angelou quote yeah. <laughs> every day. And so um, people remember what you said, you know, and how you said it. But you know, people change with heart, with heart. And right. so like you have to, you know, people will never forget how you make them feel. Mm -hmm. And so part of the work that I do and and would like to do more work in is to get people to feel, cause like you mm -hmm. know, there's a lot of more injury. Um, going on about like within you know white bodies um, like hear, hear nothing see nothing say mm -hmm. nothing you know mm -hmm. what I mean and so um, it, they have to feel it you know they right. have to be in a room with people and see how like th this culture this thing yeah. this system has changed people's lives every time I walk in a room I'm automatically in the in the spaces that I'm in I automatically count how many black people in there you know what right. I mean mm -hmm. and so the fact that I like I think we did a training at my my place of employment, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and uh, Don't name I, won't, it. <laughs> I won't tell. We did a place of appointment, and um, someone who was probably in his sixties, he's retired already. He said that he, you know, we asked him when was the first time that you noticed race, like that you were white or black or mm -hmm. whatever, and he said he didn't really noticed it until he got into the counseling field and that was his second you know career mm -hmm. and so and he was like I still don't really see it but then it was like people in the room people of color uh, black and brown bodies in the room and we were like I know I notice it every day I walk up into right. like this this job this establishment Can you know be real though yeah like, yeah this if is all you, about being real yeah if you, I'm just if, saying. You, if you are if you are in a brown or black body and I like using these terms right because it doesn't identify ethnic group. It, it, right, it's right. just how we operate. Right. We, we walk in the world. Look how, the world how I see us. Yeah. This is how they see us. Doesn't girl. matter. Cause she no matter Haitian, what, she, I'm Haitian. I'm, yeah. I'm still gonna be black. They're gonna, right. gonna call me yeah, African American. Exactly. It doesn't yeah. matter. Um, she from she from Africa. <laughs> I am well, African. Yeah, but, but, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, That's a whole nother story yeah, within itself. Yeah. Like where everybody. But I remember like distinctly. Like I grew up in Little Haiti, Miami. Um, although I was born in Miami, like I grew up around Haitian culture. We yeah. had our own little bubble. 
And I remember distinctly, I went to a, a Haitian, a Haitian preschool. I went to a Haitian church. I lived with my grandmother who didn't speak a lick of English. And I just remember when I finally moved in back with my parents, um, they were a little bit on a, a, you know, whatever. I was the youngest. I was not planned. So I was living with my grandma first, moved in with my parents. And I finally went into a school like second grade. I learned then that I was black. And I just remember trying to wipe my skin clean of my blackness. Mm -hmm. And my grand, my mom, my mom told me when I was like around 16, how Kim, you made me cry on that day because you thought you can clean away what God made you and mm -hmm. that you thought your skin was dirty. And I was only in second grade. So the fact that black and brown bodies, it doesn't matter if they really understand what the, what's going on in the world. Like we feel it. Mm -hmm. And it's, you don't have to. You don't have to yeah. be around white people. Mm -hmm. I was yeah. in Miami. I was surrounded and by Caribbean folks. And uh, I was fortunate to go to all like throughout my like education to go through go where I was the majority. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. But I still felt that internalized oppression because um, my grandma, like I had like mixed cousins and mm -hmm. stuff like that, and. Um, my grandma was um, Cherokee Indian mm -hmm. and she had long beautiful hair and so my mom and everybody else they was lighter skin right. I was like me and my older brothers was darker skin mm -hmm. and they used to say my brother was light skin they said his daddy was the milkman mm -hmm. and so you know my hair when I went natural like yeah. they had a fit like um, just like you know and you better get you a light skin mm -hmm. you know you better get you a, a, a light skin man with good hair oh mm -hmm. they got good hair so like you still mm -hmm. like felt that even if you like that internalized oppression even right. if you wasn't in um like a white community a white community yeah. or going to like when i first like like saw the the real like culture shock was when i went to um went away for college and i went to a predominantly white institute mm -hmm. and like yeah like I it yeah there was like less than it was one percent that was black mm -hmm. you know and so like I was it was a shock I had a hard time adjusting unfortunately I went to a um and I'm gonna say the name of the school because I do that okay so, um so I, when I was living in Dallas I went to Lake Highlands High School mm -hmm. and at that time I was like man there's a lot of white folks here so that was my mentality but then like my mid junior year. Uh, my parents moved to this little small town, like way north of Dallas, called Wiley, mm -hmm. and uh, Wiley I ain't was heard of Wiley. is predominantly white. Mm -hmm. Like literally, when I went to the high school, our, like our, our, yeah, it was a <laughs> <laughs> it was literally across the street from a cornfield because like the housing area. Yeah. Um, so the like that area is way developed now, but like when I was in school, it wasn't. Um, but I had long dreadlocks, as y'all can see. Kind of yeah, yeah. Um, so when I went there, I was like, there was two, there was two of us that had dreadlocks, but mine were like longer. And then I'm a black male going into the school. Mm -hmm. um, the other person there that had dreadlocks had lived in that area longer, so they was he the token, token white, a black dude. There was there was other black people there. Okay. But like you know it. With the went, dreads. No, there was only two of us with the dreads. Mm -hmm. But um, and, and she was a black lady or girl at the time, of course, whatever. Um, but like when I went into the school, so day one, when my dad's enrolling me. I could see people walking past the office, kind of looking at me. I'm like, oh, geez, like this is how this is gonna start. So then, like, um, like where the office was located, you can see the cafeteria. So when I walked into the school, it almost felt like those movies where you. Mm -hmm. uh, forks and everything drops and everything goes super silent. Yeah. Because it, it really almost, the only difference what I just said, I didn't hear forks drop, but it literally got silent when people looked at me and I was like, wow. And I never felt that like that. Like that's I've been places. you noticed that you was, you was black? That's when I started to get, um, no, I've been a negative, black. A negative, like, experience. It was it had more of a culture shock, mm -hmm. but being around the white folks there, um, it started to open my eyes to a different way of how they are. Um, Cause you had like two different kinds of groups. One where I knew you're, you're, you come from a racist family, mm -hmm. but the thing is I'm too mysterious for you. So you don't know how to handle me. I'll say, right. Mm -hmm. Then you have the other people who um, I say have identity or culture shock within themselves, still white people, but they want to identify as black people, but or identify with black people, you know, be 
I don't like saying acting black. Yeah. But they just want to relate. They really want to relate. Connect. But you can't. They was acting black. Yeah. Just say you say you was gonna be real. But there's no. Well, because no then I have a whole thing with black. acting black, right? Oh, you're not monolithic. We okay. all have so many different experiences, and that's a whole nother thing. Like racism. Well, actually, actually, I could, I can't say acting black, right? Yeah. Because they're not, and you're trying to portray something that you're not. So right now, you're acting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I had a couple of them on like different occasions because they're cool with black people mm-hmm. there. They thought it was okay to call me nigga, and I'm like, oh. no. You know, I would have cut him like <laughs> myself. Then I'm not gonna say what I said Attorney. then, but I was like, hey, like, you know, this is like the PG version of what I said. But I was like, hey, don't call me that because um, I'm not like the other black people here, and different things will happen. Mm. <laughs> 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 then what you might when you deal with them, but when you deal with me certain other stuff is going to happen because mm-hmm. I don't come from that, that background that they do. I come from a different light. Yeah. So they're like, oh, yeah, I'm like, no, it's cool because I, I can tell you said it so comfortably because these other people let you yeah. say it. Or you mm-hmm. say it at home with your peoples and, you know, I don't know how you, how, what definition mm-hmm. you use it. Yeah. Are you using, like, we cool or using, like, like right. them, them over there. To me, yeah. I just hear this is one word to me. But, but you know, right. that's yeah. what they, in their mind, that's what they think. It's like, but we cool. That's what, mm-hmm. It's a term of endearment. Right. Whatever. Right. Yeah. But like being at that school also started to help me think kind of like what y'all are talking about now. It's like the word deconstructing racism. I didn't know racism had a definition, so I'm not even going to pretend like, well, you know what? I was way ahead and knew that. No, I didn't. <laughs> but like, I'm like, this is just like, wow, this whole experience. And it's like, okay, like, you should do an undo racism. I, I, if you want to do it, you, we can get you in. Get you, I know some people. We know some people who know some people who know some magic. Who so give you all the definitions. I'm it's a, it's a it. life-changing experience. It is. It is. I've only been to one, but, you know, we, I've been to a lot of groundwater analysis training. And that's, that's like Joyce James. She's done over 100 pe- people that's what she trained. But anyway, yes. yeah, we get to a firm understanding. Yeah, I like that. Um, we can get, like, get you in. Like so the whole point of conversations is to have these conversations yeah. to in the end result is to make a change and mm-hmm. um, uplift and educate people on different things that they are what we say ignorant about mm-hmm. um, and make them open their eyes like hey okay this is what this is and we need to start like I said healing and I like that y'all said that because especially like with racism um, and y'all mentioned like being um, in your neighborhoods and feeling it, but yeah. not even necessarily knowing what it is. What it but it's just like you're saying, all that energy has been perpetuated for hundreds of years and it just kind of sticks with our people. So it's like, okay, how do we get past this? Because uh, me and my dad used to always say, like, when black people, we start trying to be like, okay, we start trying to get past it, then something else happens. Mm-hmm. So it's like it, those wounds keep opening and opening. It's like, okay, what do we do? Because um, I hate to say it, but marching isn't working the same that it used to. Um, they found out how to, you know. But then violence ain't the answer either, because we can go kill a bunch of white folks, right? But what that's going to do? Now we just murderers. All I can say, I'm <laughs> going to speak, I'm going to my Haitian hat now. Yeah. Because um, living, being part of this ethnic group and having mm-hmm. this history and then also walking as a black American because that's how the world treats me. It right. took, I had like a lot of cognitive dissonance but then there was a, a, a awakening that happened. What does cognitive dissonance mean? So yeah. cognitive dissonance is when you hold two views as truth but they're opposing mm-hmm. in your mind, in your body. I'm going to say body because we like to th- get in our bodies. Yeah, yeah. Like you literally feel as though you believe. It's like you love both your parents but they get in divorce but you're trying to, you can't pick and choose because you love both of them. That's right. sort of kind of what it is with the ideas. <laughs> So I, you know, because I I was really raised in Haitian institutions in Miami, and then when I started learning more about history of black people in the, these United States, I realized there were two mindsets. And I feel as though every movement had these mindsets. And um, so here in black history, we have those two archetypes, MLK and, and Malcolm X, mm-hmm. right? MLK and Malcolm X perfectly mirrored those archetypes of Haitian revolutionary history, where we had Toussaint Liberture and um, 
Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So if you guys don't know the history of Haiti, and I feel as though every black people around the world should learn the history of Haiti, because what you see is happening in Haiti right now is global racism, yeah. institutional racism. Um, is that those two mindsets, um, one of those archetypes, he wanted to be in with France so much. So he wanted to be able to be accepted by people. He wanted to be able to flourish in French society. Mm -hmm. The other was like, I don't care what they say to me. I am a human being. I just want my people to be free. I want all people to be equal. And Haitian history, those two mindsets, and then the decision to die or be enslaved or to die and fight for everyone's, the, the, the native people, the black people in the island at that time, that decision to do that is kind of what forced us to like help us win our independence. Mm -hmm. We fought off France, we fought off England, we fought off so many European powers. They they just couldn't do anything. But so how did they enslave us by globally the the economics? How right. does it like? Because you know you know in our trainings we try to stay like in America in United America in yeah. America. So how does it like? you know bring it back to like america and the other side that you fight with the thing the thing that i remember is that you have to make sure that you get rid of the co-conspirators mm -hmm. not like kill them like haitians right, did right, in yeah. history <laughs> but like we literally killed the black people who were trying to get in with the enslavers mm -hmm. so if we didn't cut them out silence them put them away so they can't ruin the revolution then we were able to overthrow and fight the system and change it so here in the United States, in my head, I'm like, okay, there are a lot of black people who are still trying to try to be. get rid of them. I don't want to get rid of them, but mm -hmm. even in our families, even to this day, right. there are a lot of people who are oppressed who want to get in with the oppressors. Yeah. And that will never happen. And until people are willing to sacrifice and to make sure everyone is equal. That American dream. That, that American world. dream. We would never be able to change the who's the uh, the the group in power in the United States and it takes a lot like it's hard because it's a different system you know because we were founded on this Haiti was founded on equal quality for everyone we even call the Polish people our brothers and black brothers and sisters like black is our Negro in Haiti mm -hmm. we call everyone black even if they're not black yeah like that's a that's a word of empowerment because that's what they use to messes up back in the day right. so it, it's hard like I have to battle that when we're doing yeah. work we're focusing in the United States I'm always in my head trying to okay how be like I'm Caribbean though I'm Caribbean I can't get rid of my Caribbean <laughs> yeah it's not it's being on the Caribbean it's just that mindset and then seeing how the system really messes us up messing up it messes mind. us up mentally and it messes us up like heart wise mm -hmm. like you're willing to hurt another human being and like even putting the spirituality into it I tell people like racism is perpetuated because you your you have to break your humanity in right. order to dehumanize someone else. Right. So when we look in these books and we see these kids, what? you know, oh, my back hurt. I'm sorry. I had oh. postpartum stuff. You see these kids, white kids, looking at these lunchings. Yeah. Unfazed, and that's what like Robin was talking about. Like white people got to heal too, because mm -hmm. you're able to dehumanize other people and not feel like there's a you justify that. Yeah, you justify or... dehumanizing a whole another group. Yeah. And like you're saying, the fact that they're desensitized by that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's... Yeah. She <laughs> it's said a, a lot. Like, she I said, said a lot. lot. It's hard yeah, for no, me. No, like, it's just like... The fact that you're like, desensitized. My content and dissonance is hard because I have to transition like, and see how it relates to like, the United come on, come States. On, how does it... But you asked me how, like, the cognitive dissonance know, plays I'm itself. To, I'm trying to, like, So that's how I see it. Like, if you de could we use dehumanization, this? man. Is that a social work term? Or is that, like, a term? I think what it's a term? psychological term. Cognitive, cognitive dissonance is in psychology. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you, you know, we need to, you know, can't just be... PWIs, all the acronyms <laughs> and cultural competency and all this. Yeah. First, the inclusion, like, and even racism has its own, like, like the definition. Like, yeah. Right. The, like, yeah. But, like, I'm definitely glad y'all gave that definition because when you did, like, that. It helps. 
it helps it with just conversations. My eyes a whole nother like it really helps levels, like yes. different thoughts. But yeah, I made you, myself at home. Oh no, it's good. Like this is <laughs> oh, okay. like, this supposed to be You're supposed to be chill. We having like relaxed we conversation. Chill, we chill. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is sad that like how not even just the the white kids are desensitized. I see even like younger black kids mm-hmm. are just as equally desensitized. And almost like even when I see the some of the younger generation get mad. It's almost like they're getting mad because that's what you're supposed to do, mm-hmm. but it's, but sometimes I feel like they don't really feel the anger, like right? Until almost like they're just following. They the, have the talk, so you have the talk, right? And that's oh, the yeah. thing. That's <laughs> yes, yes. the talk. Like, have you? Do you know what the talk is? Like, a lot of people don't. Like, mm-hmm. police officers don't know what the talk is, and um, somebody said it clearly um, yesterday. Like. I didn't know that they don't know what the talk is because I know what talk is like mm-hmm. the talk. Yeah, and it's it's not only it's not only about policemen though. You right. have to talk like, hey, you can't act this way, right? Because you won't be treated the same way. Mm-hmm. Like the repercussions are different because the yeah. way that they see you. Mm-hmm. Like that talk, man. My neighbor says it. Her third grader, she has to have the, have like remember that you're different because we live in Georgetown. Yeah, mm-hmm. in Liberty Hill. Right. And so she has to have a talk with her daughter, like remind her daughter every morning when she leaves the house, like you look different, you're different from everybody. Mm-hmm. So people are going to expect different things, mm-hmm. and you're going to be treated differently. And you know, third right. grade, like imagine like like that that being ingrained to you at, in you in an early age, like that generational trauma, you know, because mm-hmm. like she she's having a problem with her teachers, and she's like she had to run a lap, and she was like, did anybody else that talked without raising their hand had to run a lap? Mm-hmm. She was like, no. I was like, well, go with your gut, and you need to go to school tomorrow and tell them how you feel. Mm-hmm. And then I, I was like, and I tell people all the time, and I'm go like, because we're talking about trauma or mm-hmm. whatever. But we, um, and I can, I have a lot of cases with trauma because I work at a, um, I work in the clinical field, like right. at a hospital. I worked at a hospital, but it was this um, 16 year old man. This is the time when, um, uh, when. Fidel Castro was was oh, was okay. killed. Yeah. Um, so the 16 year old male he uh, came in with increased paranoid delusions, mm-hmm. um, and he had thoughts of to harm others. And so mm-hmm. he told like teachers and stuff that he wanted to, if, you know, he couldn't go to sleep. He was having nightmares about right. somebody killing him. Mm-hmm. And you know, and so if you saw that on social media about like it was all up on social media and even like history like what with everybody else you know the young black man never dying Mm -hmm. like why is that diagnosed as like you know i don't know if you know like terms or whatever but like paranoid schizophrenia or whatever like i had i got another client on my case so paranoid schizophrenia but he has problems with police yeah and he has a real reason right to have problems with the police because like and the kid the kid like they didn't understand it was like well you know are you sure you're gonna hurt somebody and he had like dreams that at night that he was right. going to be killed and so yeah. he wanted to like sleep with a knife underneath his right. uh, underneath his pillow and I was just like this is trauma this isn't paranoid right, schizophrenia exactly. uh-huh. this is PT- secondary trauma PTSD mm-hmm. like you have to go about treating that differently you can't mm-hmm. just medicate that you know what I mean right. mm-hmm. and in some cases you can't just EMDR that you know you have to you can talk about the like the like you know EMDR is eye movement desensitization mm-hmm. processing it's a trauma uh, modality or whatever. It works with PTSD. Works with complex trauma. Mm-hmm. But it takes a lot. But then you have to understand what the trauma is. Yeah. And then you have to, like, deal with the generational trauma. So, like, you know, you, you just have to do a lot of work within the community. Right. But, you know, people in the, psych, uh, in the in the psychiatric, you know, world or whatever, they're just going to give you a medicine. Mm-hmm. And they want to numb you. Think you think it's going to go away. It's not going to yeah. go away. Like people, like blue bodies, police officers, they still gonna have this. Um, they still gonna have like fear, fear, scare, you know, be scared for their lives or whatever. Right. They still at risk, risk to draw their weapon because they don't know the community or right. they they see like a black man, you know, getting pulled over with him sweating and being nervous or whatever, and they may think that is a sign is of him being guilty, but right. really he's scared he gonna die. Can like. I- can we mention that even <laughs> if the blue bodies blue are black bodies, yeah. they still feel this way. Yeah. Because 
if you're able, if you've been told that you're not human and you should be afraid of this person, even though you identify with that person, you look at them as an other. You mm-hmm. know, you're not trying to be part of them. You're trying to be part of the the oppressor population. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. like. And I got, I got, I'm in the military, or whatever, and I got brothers in arms, you know, blue mm-hmm. brothers or whatever, and I understand the struggle they going through too. You know, they are right. fearful, but at the same time, you need to be educated and like everybody needs to be educated. Like we sh- we got, unfortunately, we have to have the talk, and um, but you know, like when you get pulled over, you constantly what? Okay, hands on the wheels, no right. sudden mm-hmm. movements, don't speak like, too loud, don't speak. <laughs> so you know. Like don't don't stutter. Like you know what I mean. And doing having to have all those thoughts in your head, you actually start to almost do those things yeah. because now you're so super Self nervous. A couple episodes ago, we talked about being a black male in America. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah so I talked yeah. about like sometimes um, I, I specifically put my wallet in a certain area just because if I get pulled over, I want to make sure that it's clear and I can point it out that I'm getting my wallet from right here. But it's like I shouldn't have to do all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. But like that goes back it's to trauma. With, it's it, trauma. I, I can tell right. y'all what happened. To, like, it happened a while ago. My older brother, mm-hmm. at this time, he had a BMW two door. Mm-hmm. He had dreads. Mm-hmm. I remember I went to South Beach with friends, and our car got towed, and we were stranded. So, I called my big brother. I was what seven, eighteen at the time. He, and I called him to please come pick me up. It was like two o'clock in the morning, and the <coughs> fact. His reasoning, I didn't feel like he didn't care about me. Right. It's just his trauma. Like, he said, sis, I can't come pick you up. Uh-huh. You know what car I drive. If I go in that area, my brother was getting stopped by police. Like, that year he got stopped seven times because mm. they didn't believe that he owned that car. Right. And he was more afraid that if he stepped out, something would happen to him before he came to me. Right. And I, as a sister, and, and, and like... Did you understand it? I time? understood at that oh, time. Yeah. I was like, it's okay, Nancy, don't worry about it. Right, right. I called another friend. Yeah. Because, like, I didn't want my brother to go through that trauma again. Right. I was stranded in Miami Beach, but I, I like, I, 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 I did not want my brother to be further right. traumatized. Yeah, it was, How it's many crazy. questions you got left? Huh? You got a lot of questions? You got a lot of questions. I mean, I... It's a conversation. Oh, it's a conversation. It's <laughs> not like an interview. No, it's not no. an interview. Oh, okay. No, it's well, we, like we can, you gonna have to cut us off. You gotta cut I us will. off. We, I this will. is our passion. It's not, it's not so much about me. It's yeah. about the knowledge and information that y'all are gonna be providing to me knowledge. and to the people. Shh. We all got knowledge. I mean, just the fact that, look, I could have ended this whole thing off of one shot, gave me the definition of racism. <laughs> I would be like, that's it. It's it. Like, y'all heard that? Like, that is it. That's all oh, people need sorry. to know. But no, I'm saying we but do like that, that. Whenever we do trainings with people, that's like the first thing we do in training is like the definition of racism, um, because y'all had to be on the same page. And sometimes mm-hmm. we'll have like a like I remember at my job or whatever when we tried to do the training, we had I had a whole day plan, but we spent an hour and a half talking about the definition of racism. Like, and I, and I think like, like y'all said that it's very important it's the people foundation. don't understand get, what it is. Like if, if you don't know the foundation, we can't. We can't forward. have a conversation. Mm-hmm. Like you can't start a book. Tell the story, and you on page thirty, and I'm on page two. We not gonna be able to talk about the same thing, right. yeah. you know? Because you all and we and we usually take the time to like if one person is like left behind and we they like, and nah, they bro. and they have the guts to say that they don't agree They're, with something, then right. we we spend time with them mm-hmm. and through that because like if they if they say something but everybody else in the room not saying it's it's somebody else in the room that feel the same way and right. don't have the guts right. and so we like we. Y'all come along with us, cause it's a journey. Come along with us. We are gonna spend time on this, and um, yeah. So if we don't, if we don't break down that definition, it's it's nothing. And I'm still learning every day. You know, I learn you something new learn, of, yeah. of how to, of how to like you know say it and stuff like that. And you know, but yeah, so I'm doing the best I can. No, yeah, I mean y'all doing a good job. Like everything y'all told me y'all doing is like it's really really powerful because. I think a lot of this stuff need th- these conversations need to be had because yeah. um, I even find myself like in situations where I have these kind of like um, thoughts and I'm like, dang, I shouldn't be feeling like that about you know this person, but I have my reasons. But it's like even myself, I want to be you able to talk your, tuck yourself out of it. Like it's not, nah, that's not it. Well, n- not necessarily that because certain when you see certain situations, you know that's what it is. Mm-hmm. But it's like, like you know, I see a group of white people and. I know this whole situation is jacked up, but I can't start trying to put negative energy towards 
them because they're just doing their job mm -hmm. legitimately, whatever you know, whatever the thing is, and they might not have no idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Like I've actually talked to white people, and I'm like, yeah, this is what's coming, and then open their eyes because they just didn't really. Be because they, when they grow up, they're not taught like we're taught mm -hmm. to recognize certain signs and stuff. They're just taught like this is the way it is. Uh, so it's in, it's not until something happens when their eyes start getting opened up, right? Yeah. So it's unfortunate, like, you know, recent uh, events that have happened, I think it's starting to open up more and more, um, really just people's eyes, but um, like you're saying, talking about the people who are running the society and the ones who are in power, the racist, um, I think some people who initially identify with those <coughs> individuals and demographic of people are starting to change their their minds about it all, but at the same time they don't know what to necessarily yeah. do. So like sometimes I see like you know white people do march with the um, Black Lives Matter movement and mm -hmm. um, donate to NAACP and all this kind of stuff. Like they'll be a part of it, but the thing is, I think they just feel bad. But you don't know really what you need to do. And y'all mentioned Nicole. Nicole Meitzen, yes. Yeah, I did uh, go look her up, and I started to read and look at some of the stuff she's doing. So stuff like that and what y'all are doing, it's like I think those are the things that actually need to happen more because um, there is a lot of fear that people don't want to um, jump out there and do what y'all are doing mm -hmm. because they feel like um, that, you know, the repercussions of it or that they'll be judged or, you know, mm -hmm. or they'll lose their place in society or in the grid or whatever, mm -hmm. but it's like, yeah, my mom and grandma the other day. Um, well, my dad he he used to be like previous president of the Indi Indiana Ur Indianapolis Urban League, mm -hmm. and so. But my mom and grandma on my mom's side they were just like, "Be careful about that. You can't just do that and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff." And so she was scared scared for me. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you said like like understanding like it's like a blessing and a curse, you know, because like sometimes sometimes we desensitize ourselves from it because it's like a defense mechanism right. to like not you know to not feel what we feel right. or whatever but once you have the lens like you see it everywhere you mm -hmm. know and yeah. so that's the that's like the curse because like i'd be like i know and then you like have to say something you know <laughs> um but it's a blessing because you understand that this ain't right you mm -hmm. know um but the curse is that everything you see is like from anti-racist lens like you right. know when you start like because it's, trying it's to more prevalent out. in the world and society and then people yeah, like people to, believe, to believe but it, yeah. it like you're saying it's a system so it's like the whole entire system and we're in the system so essentially everything is designed a certain way yeah um i was about to say something that i shouldn't have because i was going <laughs> to oh, reflect upon my job but oh but there's like large companies and yeah. I've talked to people in large companies and they felt like um, certain people can't get in certain places even though you know there's HR and diversity groups and all this kind of stuff and maybe even the CEOs of that company mm -hmm. don't even realize that because you know they're, they're a large company but you know there's a larger company that's really that has this basically in order for them to have gotten what they where they're at they had to follow this system so they're in that system in that grid and you don't even understand that yeah, yeah you control stuff here but there's a bigger like mm -hmm. machine, machine that's controlling how you how we're allowing you to move as freely as you are yeah. so then if you let that trickle all the way down to like us um the people um who are trying to fight against the system that's why it gets so harder and I've, I've spoken to different black people and they're like, well, no, you know, all we, you know, we have the same opportunities. You know, some of us are just lazy and blah, 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 blah. It's like, it's not so much lazy. Now, there's some people who are lazy, yeah. yes. Yeah. But you can't say it like as a, uh, as a, a masses because um, it, it's really hard to function, and especially like you're saying, having that lens. Um, I know I've kind of had that lens at a young age, so I, I've seen it all the time. And then I had to learn how to desensitize myself a little bit because to, it's like to be sane, uh, to live, to be sane and to live. Because right. it's like, well, I need to get this job to so I can pay these bills and all this. So I have to like yeah. step out and like at least 
Code switch. Code switch. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, Code so switch and like, like turn off this <laughs> for yeah. one moment. Yeah. It's funny because like, you, you talked about like your job. Like we both have nine to fives. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> you know, um, my, my nine to five does great things and they support the work it's that nice I do. So, job, yeah. yeah. And so I, I don't mind mentioning my job because they support the work that I'm doing and they I want can. us to come. They want <laughs> us to come and continue do training on right. this because they realize how important it is because we, we are all about, I'm a therapist mm-hmm. um, and we're about healing. And so if we need to reach, we got to do what we got to do to reach people. Right. It's not about us. Yeah. And so they're willing to step outside. And so I call all the other stuff that we mentioned in the beginning, I call that my superhero job. Yeah. <laughs> I got a nine to five job to pay the bills. Yes. And then I'm working really hard so that my superhero job will pay the bills and stuff. Right, exactly. You know? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, we all got nine to fives here. But the thing is, that's another thing with like being black in America, right? Uh, because like sometimes you know this is what white supremacy is and you know they rely on black people to change the system and we can't because you created the system why you got that's tiring if you just like we have bowed to do this we know it's a heavy job but like it is not my job to teach white people how to not be racist Mm -hmm. that's not our job we don't don't have have my job for it we don't work we don't walk in life y'all have to heal each other and then we have to do our part so we can come as a heal two groups right. to walk forward yes. together. Because you're going to re traumatize me. I've been re traumatized by black people, I mean, by white people, mm-hmm. and they didn't understand it. And they were still like oblivious to the fact that mm-hmm. what you're saying is racist. Mm-hmm. I hired somebody as my therapist to like help with that, and she re traumatized me. And I didn't, you know, I'm just like, it is not my job. First of all, I hired you as a therapist, so I shouldn't be having to ha- educate you on like racism and stuff <laughs> like that. During session, but like, what you know, even with you know separately, you know, th- it is my job because I'm choosing to do it. But right. it, all black people don't choose to do that. They mm-hmm. that's right. not the path that they want to walk on. And so don't be trying to expect black people to you know change. Where it's not our job to do that. Right. You know, but uh, Barack, former President Barack Obama, it was not his job to change change racism he no. didn't build a system he worked you know he, he was in the system and some people may disagree with that um but like if we take everything in consideration um yeah it's not our job to to eradicate racism we did not create it mm-hmm. um we do we do there's some things in place that has perpetuated it up perpetuated it but it's not our job to eradicate racism in no America. it's like tiring you, you get tired I was just about to say that exactly. We get tired because you, you we try so hard to make it happen. It's like you trying to teach somebody who don't want to learn. Exactly. So all you're doing, you give them all the tools and everything, but they're not going to use them. So it's like because it makes them feel bad. Like oh, I'm not a racist. I'm not yeah. racist. And I, I think I don't know. Like I feel as though like you call it your superhero job. I call it just my destiny. Yeah. And like my my legacy call. work. My, 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 call, legacy. my legacy, legacy work yeah. because at the end of the day racism is going we, we going to be impacted by it but right. I feel as though I'm not saying everybody's mindset is wrong I'm just saying that there's a point where you're able to kind of step away from it being a people problem and right. looking at it as deeper than that like I keep going back to that break in humanity because I'm a very mm-hmm. spiritual person so that's how I'm able not to get tired from it that is what fuels me because my goal is to help people become whole. Like, you, mm-hmm. we are broken. Right. All of us are broken. And when you're able to look at it in that way, you have a little bit more heart. Like, I have, there's a lot of us black brothers and sisters out there hate white people mm-hmm. to the max. And me, when I look at that, I say, I understand why you hate white people. Right. I'm not going to try to change your mind. You should feel what you're feeling. But our, our, I believe you. I believe you. But my, my I'm not going to hurt hate them because that just makes my life horrible. I was going to yeah. say that. Though, to with, put with too hate, much time and energy in it. That's so tiring. It's so tiring. has too much just in the word itself, but just it's hate tiring. has too much uh, negative energy mm-hmm. and it brings you down just to walk around it every day sick. hating something. Even if it's not a, a people's, like, if you hate it's one thing just to strongly dislike something because you don't have to like everything. Yeah. To me, I feel like you don't have to like every groups of people. Mm-hmm. No, I'm not going to hate you. I just may not. You know what? I don't like black women who have earrings. Mm-hmm. I just don't. It is what it is. And you know what? Like, <laughs> and you're going to always wear earrings. I just don't like it. Yeah. That's just what it is. You know, no disrespect. I just, I, 
I do like black women. Though. Oh, okay. I was gonna yeah, say, I'm like, yeah, like, like hate, hate is like I, I mm-hmm. I'm gonna go back to the body. Like everything that we're feeling impacts our body, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I feel like so we all have energies. We all got a certain ab- amount of ball of energy that mm-hmm. we were all born with, and stress continues to chip away at that ball. And if we don't know how to, pr- if we don't learn how to protect that ball, mm-hmm. um, and grow it we could be so dimmed and burned out to the point that we can't even love even the people that we love in our lives. That's the thing, too. People don't realize... um, If you don't, yeah. If you... you, When you hate, you fixate on something, right? Mm -hmm. Because, like, you can dislike it, like I said, but if you're hating it, they mean you have a fixation on it at that point. So your your spirit is now attached to that thing that you hate. Mm -hmm. And by hating it that much, you're following it, you know... And all the little negative stuff that you hate so much about it. So at that point, if you hate something so much, to me, you are now that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, just like I, I here recently, uh, I disagree with the keep your enemies close. Or keep your, your friends, friends close, close and your, your enemies, enemies close. close. <laughs> but no, like, um, yeah, like I, I don't, I can't even feel myself hating stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So it, to I me, it's, say I don't have hate. I don't hate. I'm not perfect. No, I have but, strong, no, I have no, strong no, dislikes strong for dislike. stuff. I have strong dislikes. There's just things that you just like. I hold grudges, y'all. I'm but that's not the a Lord, hate, though. The Lord working on me with the God, <laughs> God's healer, God's healer, man. Oh, yeah, I'm working on me. But it helps. Like I remember when we had the slew of like posts on Facebook with everybody, the black man getting killed. Mm-hmm. I had like I felt it. Like I felt overwhelmed. I even woke up one morning, I'm like, God, like, what's the point of me being here? What's the point of me doing this work? What's the point of me being a social worker? What's the point of me being a woman? What is what is the point of me being here if I can't fight this? And then, like, it, it took a lot of healing work for mm-hmm. me and God to kind of help me with my processing, realizing, Kim, this is because that spark is not, like, people are neglecting that spark and that thing to love each other and to mm-hmm. see each other as, like, humans right. and, and once I put that I was like okay let me not feel overwhelmed because I know my power is within myself and how I per, you know build people up even with my little words I always tell people like look your in- intent doesn't matter it's the impact you have so from that day on like I was very clear on figuring out how I can impact people to a point to build that spark up and to help them do it for other people hmm. I have a question you guys, cause y'all, y'all talked about like the power of words, basically. Mm-hmm. Do you think our word choices on how we um, define, because um, I like how y'all kept saying, uh, you know, your bodies, but do you think the word choices that we use to define a group of people by changing that, could it make a positive impact? For instance, like I feel, so, you know, we teach kids that, you know, this color is brown, right? Mm-hmm. With a crayon. But then, as they get older, we say, we're black people. Mm-hmm. We say, you know, um, this crayon is white. But then we're like, those are white people. But then, um, we'll say, um, this particular group of people um, are Asians, right? But then we're black people. These are white people. These are Asians. So it's like, okay, well, are we judging people based off of where they're from or what they look like? Mm-hmm. Or, you know what I'm saying? It's like all that is changing. It's it's confusing. But then it's always cool to me when I see, like, little kids and they're, like, hugging another race. And they, it's like, it's just straight love. And it's and like, you know, no, no, that's my friend. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't you know. I personally don't think that a word uh, will change because there's microaggressions that mm-hmm. you know you will feel, and I think words um, bring power to like meaning. Like, like I knew I felt this way, mm-hmm. and that's what I'm feeling. That's exactly what I'm feeling. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if people like have treat people differently, or they act in certain ways, and you know it's wrong, mm-hmm. but you don't know what it is. You know, you don't know. You can't put your finger on it. Right. Like, I think, like, words give power and meaning. And so um, they could actually, um, you know, they can bring they can bring life or they can bring death or whatever. So uh, I heard, like, words basically only aid what's already there? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think so. In my opinion, maybe different. 
um, I tr- I, at one point I tried to, you know, not use the N word and things like that. And, you know, but sometimes you just gotta be <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what that means. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but even then, like, that's, that's something that's going to be like, that's, internalized in, right. in our history so much it's going to be very difficult to eradicate but um yeah I I try mm-hmm. to I don't know I try to use to not use it but it, it didn't work yeah. so but it's still but it's still but it still didn't change the fact that people saw me as that yeah. you know right. like even if I didn't say that words people still saw me as, as that some kind of negative yeah. something whatever, yeah black or black or black or white you know yeah. that that's what I was viewed as. Uh-huh. That's how you felt I was. Right. Just because you're not using the word, you're trying to change the word. That doesn't mean it. It still doesn't yeah. mean the same thing. You right. know what you want to say. It's just yeah. give identity. So that ident- identifier, mm-hmm. so to say. I think for me, I um, I don't think words in themselves have power. I feel as though the development of definitions of words from society, mm-hmm. like what what kids. They come, you teach them red, white, blue, orange. And then at as a child, you don't have any feelings elicited from these words. Right. But then as you get older, based on all the data that you collected from your experiences mm-hmm. growing up, each color, each word, if you want to use color, starts to elicit some feelings, either a right. negative feeling or a positive feeling. So I feel as though it's important to start helping like I feel as if I'm, I'm not a mom yet, but I know for me, like my goal is to counteract society's, mm-hmm. you know, the negative and positive that they attach to each word. So if I say black, like I grew up with black being a beautiful thing. I told you about my right. history, Haitian history. So when I came here, I realized black as I got older kept looking as a negative thing. Mm-hmm. So in order to contradict that, I started to uplift blackness as a beautiful thing, as a godly given thing, as a majestic so thing. Changed the meaning. I changed the meaning. So I feel as though like I think it's important that word doesn't have a problem like power. I think the definition is behind the words mm-hmm. and how society either um, forms it and throw it out as negative or positive is the most important thing. I don't know if that answers the question. It does. It does. Yeah. And yeah. then when you say and when you say racism, you know, for white people you say racism like <laughs> you gotta <laughs> you gotta understand how your body feels, feels like yeah. your they're sphincter terrified. your your sphincter like uh-huh. quenches and you know you just don't feel right your heart know? starts to pulp a little mm-hmm. bit the nervousness feel clammy you know what right. I mean yeah and so, so you just kind of like like racism within itself you be like ooh, ooh. Mm-hmm. when you hear that word it like makes you feel some type of way right you know, versus just putting it out there mm-hmm. you know or how you say you know the n word like Negro, mm-hmm. you know, you I have different different versions of it. Right, like, you right. know what I mean? How you say yeah. it. You know, how it say it has different, me- you know, but it's just, it's a word, but then, like, the meaning behind it, the definition, mm-hmm. or, um, like, how it makes you feel. Mm-hmm. You be like, <sighs> you know, that's, yeah. Because yeah. at the end of the day, like, I know a lot of white folks want to say that word. Oh, yeah, they, you know, I was watching this video on YouTube. <laughs> Like, do all white people think the same? And one woman had a nerve to say, oh, you know, they put it in a rap song. Didn't that give us permission? I'm like, first of all, hip-hop was <laughs> not for white people. That was a, a form of, you know, art to express their, you know, for the black community. So, but I, I tell people, like, look, if another person called me Negro, my body does not elicit any negative mm-hmm. thoughts because it's coming from something that is the same as I. But if a white person calls me a Negro, no matter how fancy and beautiful they say it, my body has a like has your, a your it, my body will be like intention. because it's coming from a white body right and because the way my black body and black bodies like mine in history have been mm-hmm. treated that's how that's gonna be so there's no way a white person should e- ever be able to say the n-word and not elicit a negative emotion in another i used to ask them like why do you want to like why i mean because they think it's like a cool they thing. think it's a fad thing you mm-hmm. know like and, they want to be a part of something one, and one sometimes thing, I, want culture. I, I want to appreciate that because you're you want to say it not from a negative space but no. you can never you can't do it Probably. but it's, it's it's got too much history and like the energy behind it like 
I think the majority, like the majority of people who say it, want to say it. They don't want to say it because of the term of endearment. They want to say it because they want to be able to say it and get it fly from it. No, no, that they really mean it. Like go in Texas, in Indiana. Mm-hmm. Like you've heard, I've heard some. You know, when people ain't hearing, you know, right. they they mean it a different way. So right. I think yeah. the majority people they don't say it in front of black people, but. That's they they mean it and they have a negative conversation. I say something that's kind of off topic. Yeah. yeah, it is, but it's not. <laughs> I went on a little Facebook rant the other day um, that I'm still not going to look at comments if anybody made a comment. But um, I just oh. it made me think of. <laughs> no. uh, <laughs> Dang. I mean, that's the whole point. It's like I don't have to feed into. Anyways, mm-hmm. um, but I talked about um, how I feel like celebrities and companies, if they get caught saying the the n word, they should just own up to it. Mm-hmm. Like don't don't apologize for saying it because that's not gonna do nothing. Yeah, yeah. Don't come back and say no statement and because um, I feel like sorry I can hear my dog barking. I, got, I still got Paula <laughs> Deen's the recipes. I got her. All you know what I mean? That, that's the other thing too. Sometimes yeah, you're still you're still loaf. gonna you're still gonna su- not necessarily support. You're still gonna buy it, whatever the mm-hmm. the thing is. And for the most part, I feel like a certain generation of white people they already said it. And they're going to continue to say it because that's what they grew up on. True. So I'm like, I don't, I don't know why people get so surprised. Like when older people do it. I'm like, I'm like <gasps> when was she born? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. come on, people think about like, that. I'm surprised I mean, she I don't condone it, but I'm just saying that the barbecue meatloaf recipe <laughs> and the, the old fashioned <laughs> recipe for it, like, that's I printed them off last week, but I've been making it for my. I think that's how I got my hoodie. That's his favorite. That's his favorite. Like I put favorite both of the rest. <laughs> yeah, I put them both together. Had the old fashioned and and barbecue. Have you had me loaf of barbecue sauce on it? That's the bomb. Right. Yes. And so, you know. You Sorry, know. there's a lot of but, foods that I'm learning about now. She oh, hates okay. it. She weird. I'm like meatloaf. What's that? You know. So a loaf of meat. It's delicious. <laughs> okay. It looks as weird as it sounds, <laughs> but it's good. You gotta okay. shape it like a loaf. <laughs> right. You shape it perfectly like a loaf. Like and a bread put, loaf. Like a bread loaf. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then you put some sauce on it, ketchup or barbecue I, sauce. I guess you gotta make it for me for me to figure out. Okay. Yes, you gotta cook for me. Yes. But, you know, it's 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 not pescatarian. I don't know anybody made no. Pescatarian. I, I, it's probably yeah. it's That's probably it's probably possible though. Catfish I mean, like. Ground catfish or ground? I don't know, but just make it and I'll eat it. Like, I'm not like, you know, if someone feed me, I'm not going to hold them accountable to my own eating standards. You know what I'm saying? So, but I I just, it's a, it's a culture share. You don't like like culture share. You don't like Like salt either. But salt, you can get natural flavoring from garlic and onion. Okay. You know, and herbs. Mm -hmm. To saute my stuff. We like to culture <laughs> share. Yeah. That's, just, that's, that's how you grow. Yes. And that's how we grow. As yes. Yeah. She yeah. taught me how to clean share. meat with the, with the, um, I was like, do I need, so I was like, she did her picture of that, like, cause she cooked dinner for us. Mm-hmm. And it was like, the meat was so like tender and stuff. Um, and I do clean my meat, y'all. Don't, <laughs> don't be worried. About I just taught like, her, I just taught like, her how to do this? it the Haitian way. The Haitian that's way. All. Now she puts vinegar, um, like lime, lime salt, and I, I didn't do it like that. You do it like that. You shake your head like you know. I know about it. It's almost like what it's called curing. I think it's what it is. I don't know what it's technically called. We just call it netwayevian. I don't know what that is. Netwayevian mean clean the meat. I don't know. Well, because I know I know like salt and stuff. I mean, if you think about it, when you put salt in your wounds, it helps clean it. It burns, but yeah, that's kind of what it does. It. My pork chops came out bomb. Yeah. You're welcome. You it was all tender because you know pork chops sometimes <laughs> you, you could dry up yeah. and stuff. Uh-huh. But they was like I cut it and it was like perfection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I had to scrub. I had to <laughs> scrub. Culture sharing. Culture sharing. I had to scrub the limes and stuff like that. I ain't never I'll, heard about doing that. Like I'll huh? make you some ippies. I'll make you some ippies. Oh no, the, that's no the cashew, green no thing meat. that I put. It's it's like our way of seasoning our meat. Mm-hmm. Oh. We pre make it. I'll make you some. Oh yeah, do that. And you just tell me what your hot level is because I like mine real spicy. Then, then when she make you some, and you call me <laughs> Tia. I'm just saying because you don't want to eat that by yourself. <laughs> well, I I actually like to. Uh, I'm not, I'm gonna say I like to host. She host loves hosting. Events. I do. You know, so I just had like a, teaching. We had a Fourth uh, of July. Um, we had a lot of melanin at our 4th of July seafood broil. Oh, that, mm. that was my first uh, seafood broil, and I fell mm. in love. I taught Where her how to. Oh, my god! I'm from Indiana. I'm, oh, okay. I'm not from, no, 
I know Tia from, from New Orleans. I'm from New Orleans. You, y'all from seafood. yeah. So no, no, no. It's so probably good. you probably could my seafood boy. You probably like, <laughs> <laughs> but so you know I'm very careful. But you know, I taught her how to crack what crab legs. Yes, and how to do um um crawfish. Yo, that is like a lot of work for little. Things like the crawfish don't have enough meat in I it. I get it though. I let Tia, I let Tia film for me. Like, she's a good woman. She, she be, I'm like on so the second one. She's like, here. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm still getting this one. Yeah, no, I know how to do it. My dad taught me how to do it. He'd be like, you gotta do the, you gotta do the ligaments first. Take that at the bottom, and then you gotta like crack from the bottom up. Then choo choo choo. I probably could be faster. I sound like. Oh, I don't like it. Yeah, like even yeah. my mom, she be making me like crab and, and, lot, and stuff like that. And I say, Mom, can you just take it out and just put it in the dish? Yeah. That's too much work. Yeah, I had it's good. I had Thanksgiving at my house. I heard y'all had a vegan Thanksgiving. It was, How was man, that? Oh, I need to come was, to y'all. It, it, it wasn't by us, it's by uh, two of our friends. But I was like, I was even, love y'all. I was even a little I need skeptical. To, oh, okay. I was skeptical. I wanted, oh. I was like, oh. Oh. I'm right. then we were talking about house hopping. I was like. <laughs> Sorry, I love. We fry our turkey. We fry turkey. So. I mean, deep fried turkey. Steak. It was good. That, that food was good. You, if if it wasn't for the fact that I knew they were vegan, you would have never known. You would have known. It's true. Really? Really? true. Vegan food it, is good. Because you got to think about it. It's really like with any kind of food. For the most part, most food don't have taste until you put seasoning on it. Mm-hmm. So if somebody not to season whatever the thing is well, then it's because that's really what you're eating. Is exactly. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is certain like meats where like. They have kind of a sweet. different taste, but, but like yeah. for the most part, it's that season it's that seasoning. enhances its natural flavor to whatever that thing is. Y'all ain't convinced me. I like bacon. Oh, um, swine is good for your spine. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I never heard that before. Swine is good for your spine. Wow, <laughs> I never heard that before. Yeah, that's because that came from me. Right. Okay. I'm a poet and a lyricist, so I had the right to make up stuff. Okay. Um. <laughs> But one thing I want to ask y'all too, uh, so I felt like the first step, like y'all said, is the definition of racism. Mm-hmm. What would y'all say, what is the next step at that point? Once the whomever, the group of people that y'all spoken to, once you feel like they understand what racism is, where do we go from there? Well, like in our trainings or whatever, we try to like do the individual first, mm-hmm. like feel it, you know, ha- like connect it to you know your body Mm -hmm. and then like it's some individual work that needs to be done because you um you may not feel comfortable having those conversations with you know people at your workplace or people Uh you have different levels of comfort comfortability or comfort Comfort. yeah Yeah. have different levels of comfort Mm -hmm. and so you know feel comfortable with they may take a long time and i'm not saying you can't do any work like in the community Mm -hmm. without that but you just have to have a certain level, a certain comfort level to be able to talk about it. So individual work, do your own work first. Um, if you decide after we, because we've done our work, and mm-hmm. for like black women, like it's just a lot of things that you have to tear down and reconstruct yourself. Like you talk about deconstructing, you know, you have to reconstruct some some of your right. viewpoints as well. Mm-hmm. And so, um, like like getting knowledge on on racism or anti racism on white supremacy, just like. You know, just get what you're interested in. Like, mm-hmm. um, we have like ladies that we work with that they're like they love anti-racist white supremacy. Right. Like, I love racial racialized trauma, and mm-hmm. so I'm just getting knowledge on like what I want to mm-hmm. what's close to me. You know, is which is breaking generational curses, and so um, find your comfort level, um, do your own work, and then have those conversations um, with with people and you you never know like if it's really close to you if you've had an event a significant like life-changing event that mm-hmm. happened in your place based on like racism like you may like go past that within you know there's a lot of movies out there on netflix mm-hmm. you know 13th 13th is good yeah mm-hmm. like i think i watched that like you know when it first came out and then just just what you and you know your own once you know your own personal story can't nobody take that away from you right yeah like once you understand like this happened to me and it was wrong can like be comfortable with yourself mm-hmm. first and then go and learn everything you can i'm still learning i'm still increasing my capacity to learning and anti-racist work um but i'm gonna say this i'm rambling but 
Your oh, first? No, I was just, oh. I was just listening. Oh, this is my social work listening. Oh, it's just like, social work like, listening. I just really <laughs> look deep yeah. into people. Just but to yeah, them, so yeah. learn your, understand your story. Because mm-hmm. can't nobody take away how it how made you feel and how right. you feel. Can't nobody say, well, you know, that's not true. I'm like, it, I felt this way. So uh-huh. you can't right. tell me that I didn't feel this way. And you need to respect my feelings, right? Mm-hmm. That's my therapist coming yeah. in, right? <laughs> my communication, like. I feel right. Can't nobody take that away from you, and then go from there. You know, find your comfort level, um, get involved, be around people that look like you. Like if you're black, be involved in conversations that look like you, that having mm-hmm. intentional conversations about racism, mm-hmm. um, and that's a whole nother area because that's where healing comes from in the black community, um, churches, um, the barbershop, beauty shop. Like those type of building those communities, that's what really helps with the healing process. Mm-hmm. Like having safe, not safe spaces, because like a you space know, where you can be vulnerable. Well, a space right. where you can and be vulnerable, real, where uh, you can be uncomfortably, you can be comfortable being uncomfortable. Right, yeah. right. So, and then I mean, then you go from there. But that's I think that would be the first step. Like learn your understand your own story first, and it's like thing to do when it comes to understanding your story we tend to romanticize our thought like our our memories Mm -hmm. like it takes a lot of effort to kind of tear down those you know walls that we put around these memories and really see the memories for what they are Mm -hmm. like yo this happened to me and this was actually racial trauma but i actually going deep into these memories and kind of understanding that will help you shape your story and um, you gotta be that feeling. You gotta allow yourself to feel. Can we? Can we all say that? Don't desensitize yourself. Don't desensitize yourself. Something's wrong. Yourself. Something's wrong. It's probably wrong. Cause that's that's how like racism, the system in here in the states. That's how we've grown, become what we are right now mm-hmm. as a black community in the country. Like we don't talk about trauma, whether it's racial or not. We don't want to talk about oh they did what to who we don't talk about that in the family mm-hmm. we want to we want to hush it down and then that's so not good so for our mental community. health right. not for our spirits not for our souls not for our bodies so like it's important to be okay with being in pain mm-hmm. be okay with being in pain but that's good pain like they say you know when you're building a muscle you got to tear that muscle a couple that's times right. rebuild mm-hmm. it but if you never tear that muscle you're not going to build the strength um and like i know one thing like the strong black woman thing I hate that thing. I tell people I am not a strong black woman. I am a human being. I need to cry. I need to feel. I need support. Mm-hmm. I need to be able to feel what I'm feeling and get the support that I need. I like can't. black do crack. <laughs> black do crack, man. Yeah, I'll try. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, we don't go. look like it. But I'm we gonna, crack. I'm gonna see. Like Tia is uh, doing some work with uh-huh. uh, that, that that play, the play, uh-huh. right? Right. Mm-hmm. So she was, yeah, black do crack. It's okay. Yeah. So you have to be able to like deconstruct all those you know archetypes and what people the society says you have to be you know black men and women and brown black bodies everyone has Mm -hmm. to do that white people have to do that as well because if we don't do that and then get to the root of who we are you can't move forward with this work that's true you can't so essentially like you say white people um, need to also be able to talk about their stories as well Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe on the reverse side of it where within each other yeah and keep each other accountable because it's hard it's really dangerous to do it like across Mm -hmm. the groups because you might be re-traumatizing people like i've had that like yeah we've had that happen unfortunately i've had that personally like yeah personally yeah i have white friends friends. Mm -hmm. like i I genuinely like this was my charge like God helped me to be a really good friend to my white friends mm-hmm. like I want to be a sister mm-hmm. to them as much mm-hmm. as I can but that racial thing we have to be able to move past it, and it's painful like I know I've had conversations not like attacking but the thing with white supremacy and what's you know not only allowing us to feel but when we tell our stories nobody wants to pay attention to the important person in that story us Mm -hmm. So they pay attention to everybody else in the story and try to justify why the other people did what they did in their story and never listen to just us, what we felt and what we experienced. Mm -hmm. But if you're standing right there and you telling somebody, this is how I felt, like if you understand your narrative, it's very, really, really hard for them to look you in your eye and just to be able to like, you know, people do it, people do it. It happens, it happens, but it's, you know you can be like if they see you and if you have a relationship with that person and they don't want you to hurt they, they will change they will do the work on yeah they'll do the work mm-hmm. yeah. they will do the work they don't want to re-traumatize you mm-hmm. they right. don't want to re-traumatize you but like I said it's good for those people too to also go 
check into the feelings that you're giving to them, right? So, yeah. like, if I'm telling you, like, yeah, I was here and this happened, I felt this and this, um, it would be good for the individual receiving that, whether like to be a white person or another black person that's just like, man, you're just making this racist and stuff mm -hmm. up or whatever, yeah. to actually go look into that and, like, basically fact check me, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, why I'm saying these things go basically debunk everything I'm saying. I'm if saying you could do that, then that's you painful. know what? It's painful. Maybe though. maybe you were right. Mm -hmm. But the fact that, like you're saying, when you just walk into a certain space and you're like, okay, like. Mm -hmm. It's like, and my friend uses this analogy like really well. Like if um, someone, one of your friends uh, had like, say their, you know, their, their mom just passed away. Mm -hmm. You know, you wouldn't be like, you know, what would you say to that person? Would you be like, oh, yeah, my mom, my auntie passed away too, man. You know, that, yeah, it happens, you know. Like, <laughs> right. you know, you would try to. Con it's you like would, sympathy versus yeah, empathy. Yeah, yeah. yeah like you, but that just, like, to prove that you just trying to take. You take know, it you away from them. Take it and away. It's not and even they're sympathy. It's just you putting it on you. Yeah, like you it's put, all about you. Now. Yeah, yeah, or just kind of like desensitizing it because you feel uncomfortable. You don't really want to talk about grief right, and yeah. stuff like that, or whatever. You know, the right thing to do is like, okay, I'm sorry you feel that way. Mm -hmm. You know, like your mom, your relationship with your mom was was your relationship, mm -hmm. and can't nobody take that away from you. Mm -hmm. And so, like, kind of, you know looking at from that from like a, a racist thing and if something happens to you where you feel like you a victim of racialized you know like you a target or whatever and you know like white people shouldn't be like oh yeah I, i'm a woman and i understand you know we got we gotta stick together us white you know you know like i i get it's discriminated beautiful. against all the time you know right, what i mean that's like that's really cool. like taken away like exactly yo what my white friend like, did to me and it was so painful like not validating your story yeah. like they were like trying to i get it they're trying to relate the best way they could but, but you, you can't do that say just, be like, just be silent that sucks or that it's sucks okay to be silent. That sucks, yeah. you know that sucks and then if you at a place well, what can i do about, you know to help you because that also goes back to like say how society is you're conditioned to um like say oh, okay they're feeling this kind of way so mm -hmm. You're conditioned to do that kind of stuff. Try to relate. Yeah. Relate, I say. Or you feel uncomfortable. By saying those kind of things. Like, oh, I was in a situation like that. Because a lot of jobs teach their employees that kind of stuff, right? To, mm -hmm. When they talk to customers. To um, basically try to be empathetic with them. And relate to them. And say stuff like that. So it's like, you got to think... Um, Many, I've, I've worked at like different jobs and it's been those same kinds of um, creeds or whatever you want to call it, those same kinds of um, psychological techniques is what I call it, um, in, at three different companies and they basically said similar kinds of things. It's like, okay, so three separate companies that don't necessarily have a correlation with each other, that means that mindset came from something else yeah so then like again it goes back to how far do you want to go back to where this came from but um so you think like in most people at work most of your day and days of the week you're at your job so not only is society kind of having that uh that psychological mm -hmm. thought to relate you, to relate yeah. to yeah. people then you you deal with that all day at your job so then it's like essentially when you're just like free from whatever, people don't know how to really deal and interact with each other. And I think that's another mm -hmm. definition <laughs> issue, right? Because we automatically equate empathy to relating, mm -hmm. um, to understanding. I know for social workers, I hope all social workers are getting to this point, but like when we work with clients, whether that's in therapy or a therapeutic case management relationship, when a resident tells us they're feeling something, I know I would never, because I felt this racial trauma, right. I will never tell my, my my clients, I understand. I would say, nope, I hear you. Tell mm -hmm. me more. You give them that space or to I kind believe of feel, you. or I believe you, I hear yeah. you, tell me more. Let That's how you validate. Because when you say you don't understand, no one understands your, your what you're going through. Um, but like we, we, there's this thing called like, we don't self-disclose. Like we don't put our own experiences in unless it's therapeutic for the client. If it benefits if them. If it benefits them to help them get through something. So 
there are some bad mm-hmm. social workers and therapists out there because you know they put their own and, self. They put their own self and they take over because they feel comfortable. They co- like in my situation, the white person felt comfortable. <laughs> Um, felt sorry. uncomfortable being, you know, like about what was happening with the things that happened in Charlotte, mm-hmm. and she obviously knew that I was, so, I was a social worker. She's a social worker that I did stuff with, real, mm-hmm. and she wanted to hear what I had to say, and she tried to take it upon it to like I was affected by that when I wanted to talk about something completely different from that. In her session, but you know, yeah. I was just like, let's just agree to disagree. And she knew I'm a veteran, so she was like, "What do you think about the flag?" And blah blah. blah. I was just like, "Uh." I don't really want to talk about this. I did have some stuff. I had some stuff written down I don't want to talk about. And she felt bad. She stayed extra 30 minutes. But I never went back. Oh, yeah. um, but she felt uncomfortable. She was like, do you, well, do you think if people voted for Trump that they're racist? I was like, I don't know. Like, lady, stop that's putting your the, stuff yeah. on me. Yeah, that's not the my. Therapist at that's that that not. Right. So she was yeah. only focused on herself, you know, and weren't worrying. Maybe she was worrying that I thought she was, you know, that she thought I thought she was racist. I didn't care anything about that. So you know, until mm-hmm. you able to, you have to do that individual work, right? And and not just understand like your your bias, your mm-hmm. where your intersectionalities are, or whatever. Not understand, not just understanding your bias, but also just like this is not about you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, why are you trying to make me use me as your client? someone who's vulnerable mm-hmm. you know but i already shared this in this power dynamic this power differential relationship mm-hmm. you know why would you use me to make yourself feel good like if you feel you feel guilty about being a racist i don't that's between you, you and, and who at you it's funny that that response i've seen that in a, a lot of white people when you bring forth racism to them that's how they respond to it basically they're just on the first mindset of how do I prove to this person that I'm not, I'm not racist? racist? Yeah, yeah. And sometimes because like, I might not even said you, I, 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 I honestly might not have thought you were, but now mm. that you're getting real defensive, defensive and weird with yeah. it, now I think, what are you trying to hide and protect at this point? So now, now you seem like you might be a racist because, mm. like, what are you? Wh- why are you? What are you trying to explain? There's nothing to explain because I didn't accuse you. Right. I'm just saying like. This and this happened. I don't and this care if you had a black roommate. I don't care. Oh, if I your, had a black friend when I was cousin, little. Uh, yeah. Your cousin married a black guy. Or, oh, my husband's black. I don't care about my, my <laughs> wife is black. It doesn't matter. It's not like valid. <laughs> you trying to bat like I, that doesn't mean that you still can't be racist. Or, I remember going to a, a podiatrist and uh, the I was getting like the doctor's aid or nurse mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, it was a, a white guy. And I think I had like a, you know, RBG, like wristband or something on. Something that identified that maybe I might be um, pro black or whatever, mm-hmm. right? But, you know, I'm talking to the, the white guy, like, because, you know, it's cool. Mm-hmm. I just talk to people. Like, I ain't one of them people that always got somebody got to throw blackness out or nothing yeah. like that. But I can tell, like, at some. Basically, he, he, he brought up that he, his wife was black. But mm-hmm. I can tell through our conversation. <laughs> 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 My wife's black. But he, he, I can tell at some, like, he'd been wanting to tell me. Well, he was excited, right? I get, yeah. Admiration. Like, yeah, but I'm I'm with you. He was trying to say I'm an ally. But at the same time, I mean, finish your story. (laughs) But, like, in a conversation, I don't even know, because he kept, like, saying, like, different little stories, right? Uh And I was just like, okay, like, can you defend this? Yeah, can you just, I just can't hear from my feet, please. (laughs) So then at some point, he, I felt like he said all these other stories just to get to this one story <laughs> so he could figure out a way to throw this story in. Like, I think like we were talking about food or something. And uh-huh. Something in food and this, and, you know. You're trying so, to get your support first. Yeah, yes. just talking about food in general. He was like, yeah, because, you know, uh, my wife, um, I'm assuming you're married to a black woman, right? I was like, yeah. <laughs> He's like, well, because my wife is black too. And, you know, sometimes she cooks a certain thing. I was like. Oh, that's why all oh, this, that's all this he had to set it up. Yeah, so you just really want to tell me that you had a black wife. <laughs> and just to see, I guess, like I mean he wanted he wanted to be like in, you know. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. But the thing is that You just wanted your feet fixed. <laughs> that's not what the fuck. You just wanted to go. 
Okay. <laughs> but nah, but I just thought it was interesting. I'm like, what establishing it was this? Was this in Austin? No, no it's in Dallas. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey. <laughs> Why? It happens more in Austin. Well, no, I was uh, just, I, it we've been really it careful does. to not mention, it does. like, establishment. Because uh, you, you contradict, kind of contradicts yourself. Because when you were talking about the high school thing, you was like, I'm going to tell, I don't, I'm going well, to tell my establishment. Re- but then when you was talking about your job, you was like, I can't really tell. Well, because, you know, I <laughs> so, got to protect my job. But yeah. with the, with but the high school, saying, the reason why, um, and I always bring up the town of Wiley, uh-huh. and that high school is, because the experiences I had there. Mm-hmm. So I feel if y'all have a problem with what I'm saying, you need to make the change. change. Mm-hmm. So yeah. make make my stories be false, right? Mm-hmm. Because like make my stories be old news. But the fact that I can go there probably, probably now stuff has changed a little bit more because it's, it's becoming more diverse. Okay. But I remember like leaving, um, I said this in one of my other podcasts, but like leaving from work and, um, like having police actually follow me, right? Like, I'm, and I'm passing up like a gas station. Like, I'm not mm-hmm. speeding, doing that, and, and like I see them speed out of the parking lot to, like, tailgate me, right? And have their brights on just to see if I'm a trip up or whatever. Um, at the high school, that high school I went to, I think it was like day one or two. I had a coach, you know, run up the stairs behind me, pat me on the back. It's like, oh, you're the new running back. Didn't even stop to like have a conversation with me about it. That was just like that. I was just like, uh, what? And then, like I said, I had. Uh, did you play? You play football? No. <laughs> <laughs> I did no kind of athletic stuff at that school. <laughs> but right, you see my right, point. Yeah. yeah. And then there was like other little stuff like that. Like I said, I had a, a white guy uh, call me the N word, and he thought he was saying it in term endearment. And I had to tell him. Um, but then it was like different things like that, and I was just like, it's a weird vibe at this school. But the flip side is, I think the majority of the staff and people they were afraid of me because I didn't conform. Mm-hmm. Like, you couldn't put me in no gangster category because if you did, then it's easy to come at me and be yeah. like, oh, this dude, you know, and um, you always keep me in detention or whatever the case is. But then I wasn't one of your athletes and I wasn't one of um, one of the other little black kids or whatever that you felt like you token. could control. Huh? Yeah, the token. Yeah, I wasn't no token. So it was yeah. like, you, you can't place me anywhere. Yeah. And I stood off to myself. So it was like, we can't we can't clock this dude. So I'm like, yeah. I knew that before I came in here. That's why I'm doing. Sp- all this was strategic, and <laughs> so and it's funny. Like I'm getting off subject a little bit. I used to break dance when I before I got to that school. I break dance at the other school, and when I got there. Um, I did still, and I found like a couple like people who did too. But we would get in trouble, right? Because you're not supposed to be playing the hallway. However, <coughs> it was almost like when the group of us are getting in trouble. Mm-hmm they didn't focus on me as much even though I'm the the one that's really but it was just like it was still like that fear of we don't know what you're gonna do like we used to have to have an ID badge I didn't want to have mine cause you was you know, but then I, see, I, was, I was actually <laughs> then after I started realizing that then I started doing more stuff just to see like mm-hmm. how they would respond right I brought a knife to school accidentally <gasps> um don't do that. do that at home, kids. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> Don't do that. But it was in my backpack, and uh-huh. I think so I had it at home or whatever, and, like, it was in my back, or I was, like, cleaning up or whatever, and I think I put it, like, for some reason I put it in my backpack, but it was supposed to be temporary or whatever, right? Uh-huh. So I was like, let me just hurry it, and then I'm, you know, put it away. When I got off the bus, I, you know, I jumped off the bus, and then, like, it fell out, and then it flipped open, and the sun hit it, and it was just like, <laughs> wow. And I just kind of looked at it, and the teacher was like, you better put that way up. I was like, really? That's your response to this? Like any other school, it's being a black man they and bringing a knife to school—that's a weapon. Mm-hmm. That's already that's all the rules, bro. Mm-hmm. But then now I thought maybe because you know it's kind of like a redneck you. school. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, you know me. But I think it maybe it was a redneck school. So like, he and, thought, like he protected himself. Yeah, and, oh, <laughs> or because a, a lot of the, the white guys probably carry pocket knives and stuff. Yeah, like yeah that's too. something like so, Boy Scout stuff. You know, yeah, like, I mean, mine was. I flip. Well, I flip out my. I carry when I'm in uniform. I carry a knife. Everybody mm-hmm. carry a knife on a Gerber, and so we all. It's like, like you need knife. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so I mean, it's it's yeah. So I'm sure that that's what would happen. Yeah, okay. Hmm. It is what it is. Yeah. I'm getting tired. I got. I'm a new mom. Oh no no! Like I'm about to cut, cut this He's down. To okay. Yeah. It's about. <laughs> It's about it's about my bedtime. Miss my baby's bedtime. Oh, man. 
Right. Just bounce out back of the husband and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I thank y'all so much for coming on. Um, I'm going to get all your information. I can post whatever information in the description mm -hmm. that y'all want if you want people to contact you and all that. Because, okay. like, yeah, this what y'all doing is, like, dope and it needs to be yeah. circulated more, especially in Austin. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of people in Austin be doing the same thing. It's a lot of Austin. Believe it or not. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like I said, it's a lot of work. It takes it a lot. Done. Well, Happy to help you out with that work, however I can. So thank y'all for thank staying you for giving us thank this platform. No problem. Thank for coming we didn't on. even talk about our business called the Growing Edge. The Growing oh, yes, Edge. The yes. Growing Edge. You want to explain the Growing Edge? So that it's that place of discomfort, mm -hmm. like when you're on top of a cliff and you feel as though you're about to fall over. But that's just what it feels like to do this work. And to kind of do the work individually right. it's painful it's like, painful but we want to keep you in that pain so you can grow from that pain yeah especially like like think about like a plant mm -hmm. and needing to like you know bloom and right. like break that break the the um, barrier the barrier mm -hmm. of the of the soil you know it's going to be painful but it's going to be beautiful mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult but it's gonna it's gonna turn out okay so yeah yeah Y'all got a website. So. It is in development. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we literally started this business like we, a week ago. <laughs> February 1st was incorporated. We've been doing it for a while, for about three and a half years. years yeah. But, um, you know, we felt that people were trying to monetize off of us. And mm -hmm. so we, it was like, we need to. You know, people trying to monetize, people were trying to, like, take what we had and just, like, put their face on it. And so right. we was like, no. And then they was limiting us on what we could do. We had yeah. this box that we had to work with. We only had to work with, like, certain with members, with certain right. individuals and stuff. And so, um, yeah, we, we didn't want anybody else to get the... The people that shouldn't get the glory get yeah, the glory. Yeah, we wanted to make sure, like, we got to understand that systemic racism, structural racism is in everything that you touch. Mm -hmm. And we were working in a system, and that system, it started to bear its head. So in order to, we want to still be, a, you know, fight part within system, it, yeah. but we also have to be a part, of, like, exit, like, have a piece of us working mm -hmm. outside so that we can properly do the work yeah, our purpose fulfill our purpose fulfill. You know, right. continue with that legacy work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, you have an email address, right? Yeah. Yes. Well, I can put your email address, and um, I can always update it. Like whenever your your website is developed, oh, I can cool. still throw that in the um, description and stuff. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank y'all.